Hello, welcome back, and uh, we are now looking at our final topic for AMP1, that is the autonomic pathway. Um, this is a nervous system, or part of the nervous system, uh, that is going to really carry with you all the way through AMP2. Uh, in fact, most of AMP2 is rooted in understanding the autonomic pathway, both how the sympathetic and the uh, parasympathetic nervous systems regulate uh, your other body systems, your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, your digestive system, your urinary system, uh, and your reproductive systems, primarily speaking. Uh, and so understanding this, auto this uh, part of the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, is really critical in understanding uh, what you're going to be going into in a lot more depth once you get into A and P2. And so uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump in and we will uh, take a look. And uh, at the end of this PowerPoint, we're going to kind of uh, look at a special topic uh, that relates to the autonomic nervous system. And so we'll kind of wait for that. Uh, towards the end. And so, as you are already aware uh, from looking at the other videos on the nervous system, uh, there are two distinct segments of the autonomic nervous system. There is the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. And we need to look at both of these systems uh, and how they regulate independently uh, and, and how they're regulated jointly as well. In other words, in our understanding of the autonomic nervous system, there is something that we refer to as autonomic tone. And autonomic tone is the balance between the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So at no point in time is the parasympathetic nervous system 100% in charge and the sympathetic nervous system shut down. And at no point in time is the sympathetic nervous system 100% in charge with the parasympathetic nervous system completely shut down. There is always a balance of activity between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. There's always a balance of activity between the two. Uh, and so one may be in charge while the other one is taking a back seat, but both of these systems are active at the same time. And we refer to that balance as being autonomic tone. And so let's go ahead and start looking at both of these systems and how they regulate really one another. And so let's start with the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, we refer to this as the rest and relaxation uh, portion of the autonomic nervous system uh, because this is what uh, usually uh, allows you to take a good nap after you've eaten a big meal. Think about Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, you stuff yourself with two whole helpings of turkey, three helpings of mashed potato. You have some some sweet potato casserole on that plate. You got some collard greens. You've got yourself some biscuits. You've got yourself some mashed potatoes, maybe some corn on the cob. You've got a side salad. I don't know why with all the other stuff you've got going on. You have yourself a helping of homemade cranberry sauce. And you have pigged out. It's not that after you've pigged out, you're sleepy. You want to lay down and you want to have a nap. It's not because of tryptophan. Right? There's not enough tryptophan in that turkey to make you want to go to sleep. You'd have to eat about 60 pounds of turkey to have enough tryptophan in you to go ahead and take a nap. You didn't eat that much turkey at Thanksgiving. And so what's causing you to want to nap? Well, stretch receptors within the stomach activate the parasympathetic nervous system. 
and when the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, blood is diverted away from things like skeletal muscle, and it is sent to the digestive system. And so your kidneys become active, your digestive system becomes active to try to process all of this food. There's not enough blood to fully uh, support function in your skeletal muscle as well as your digestive system and your urinary system. And so you rest. You give your stomach and your digestive tract and your urinary system time to process all of this stuff. Right? So you have low heart rate, low respiration rate, low blood flow to that skeletal muscle. All right. The hormone reaction, the hormone control here, by the way, the hormone of interest within the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. So we did not get away from acetylcholine quite yet. All right. Acetylcholine is the primary hormone regulating parasympathetic nervous system. In fact, it's, it's uh, acetylcholine that lowers cardiac output. It's acetylcholine that will then lead to lower respiration rates. Um, and so the effects of acetylcholine are short and local. Right? You don't want widespread shutdown of the system because if T-Rex comes running through the, 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 the street and is about ready to attack your house, you want to be able to shut down that parasympathetic nervous system really quick. So that way your sympathetic can kick in. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. A um, couple of little tidbits of information that I want to uh, relay to you. And that is uh, the neural input that, that is really regulating your parasympathetic nervous system. Most of your neural pathways are arising from the brainstem and from the sacral area of the spinal cord. All right. So um, we're talking about um, we're talking about the brainstem and like C1, C2, C3, C4, that area. And we're talking about the sacral area. We're talking about S2 to about S4. Remember, there's five uh, individual vertebrae that are fused together to make the sacrum. So we're talking about S2 to S4, and we're talking about the brainstem and C1 through about C3 or C4 uh, is where we see the majority of our neural um, fibers that are regulating the parasympathetic nervous system coming from. Um, the other thing that I will mention is that there are four main cranial nerves that are also at play here. Right? There are four cranial nerves that are regulating cranial nerve regulation. All right? That is overseeing the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and that is uh, cranial nerve three, which is the ocular motor. Uh, we've got cranial nerve 7, which is the facial. Uh, we have cranial nerve 9, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. And we have cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. Uh, and in fact, 90% of all of the regulation of the parasympathetic nervous system is coming from the vagus nerve. And so huge amounts of uh, parasympathetic function is being regulated and coordinated through the, through the vagus nerve. Um, uh, the 
cardiac plexus, the, the neural fibers that are regulating and coordinating cardiac function is coming from the vagus nerve. The neural plexus or the neural fibers that are regulating pulmonary function is coming from the vagus nerve. Um, the neural responses that are regulating the esophagus is coming from and off of the uh, vagus nerve. Um, from the esophageal plexus or the fibers, nerve fibers that are regulating the esophagus, um, they split uh, and they actually cross the diaphragm and go into the abdominal cavity where they actually start to regulate the liver, the pancreas, the stomach, the small intestines, the kidney, and about the first third of the large intestines or the colon. All of that is being regulated through the through the uh, vagus nerve. So, um, very little sympathetic or parasympathetic regulation is happening from cranial nerve three, seven, and nine. The majority of it is happening through the vagus nerve. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, the sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight response. Uh, this is your get up and go. This is T-Rex is coming down the road and you need to shut down that parasympathetic. You need to you need to down regulate that bad boy and get your system up and moving. You need to increase cardiac output. You need to increase that blood flow to the skeletal muscle. You need to increase um, blood flow going to the brain. You don't need to be worrying about digesting that Thanksgiving dinner. You don't need to be worrying about emptying that bladder. You need to get yourself up and get you moving so you can escape the threat or confront the threat. Uh, and so because this is a survival pathway, right? because this is this you're in survival mode, um, the effects tend to be long lasting and global. Right. And look at your look at your hormones that are at play here. Look at your neurotransmitters that are at play here. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are being released from the adrenal medulla. Right. So you're within your adrenal gland, you've got that thin, narrow section in the middle that's referred to as the adrenal medulla. That's where your epinephrine and your norepinephrine is coming from. Um, epinephrine is adrenaline. Norepinephrine is noradrenaline, and they have to balance each other out. This is one of the reasons why, in addition to cortisol being released, um, which is a stress hormone, this is one of the reasons why uh, you're driving down I-4 and uh, you're in the passing lane and you're doing 80, and all of a sudden grandmom is in front of you doing 45 and a 70, and you start getting agitated and you start getting upset, and you start getting flustered, and you start tailgating, and maybe you're flashing your high beams, or you're beeping on your horn. You can't go around her because there's people passing you on the right, so you're stuck. Well, all of that emotion starts to build. Right? Do you confront her? Do you act more aggressively? Do you passively pass her? What do you do? You're going to fight, or you're going to get up and go? You're going to leave the situation. Now, what usually happens is you're stuck behind her, right? you're doing 45 in a 70, and the first second you get it to go around her, you do. You put your directional on, you move over to the middle lane, you step on the gas pedal, you floor it, you're beeping on the horn, maybe you're flashing her a couple hand gestures, and you rip it back over into the, the left lane, maybe trying to almost cut her off, I'm going to show her. Right? And you're you're yelling and you're aggravated and you're ticked off and five miles later down the road you're still aggravated. It's because epinephrine is still flowing flowing through your body. Uh, cortisol is still flowing through your body. Uh, you have those long lasting effects of that sympathetic nervous system. Um, and this is also why. Um, your mother or your grandmother or an aunt or someone in your family probably has always told you, um, after you eat, you got to wait 30 minutes before you go back in the water. You can't just run right back into the ocean. You can't just go back into the swimming pool. You have to wait 30 minutes. Well, that's not an old wife's tale. There's validity to that. If you've eaten, 
your parasympathetic nervous system is taken over. You're diverting that blood away from the skeletal muscle. Um, if you're out there trying to swim, you're trying to re-divert that blood back to the skeletal muscle. So where does your blood go? Are you going to digest your food or are you going to supply blood supply to your muscles so you can swim and not drown? Your body is like tossed up. Right? And so one of two things is going to, or one of three things is going to happen. Either you're going to keep your lunch at which point in time your skeletal muscle is going to be void of needed oxygen and glucose and so you're going to cramp up because that blood supply is not going to the skeletal muscle or your skeletal muscle is going to win out your sympathetic is going to take over which means you're 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 um, devoiding your gastrointestinal region of blood supply so you're not digesting that food so you're going to puke it and so you're you're going to swim but you're going to puke or you're going to halfway both systems right? and you still might cramp but yet you're really not going to digest your food enough and you might end up getting indigestion later on because you only halfway did both systems and so there is some truth um, in that I know this might look ugly and that's okay I'm going to make this not look so ugly for you here in a few moments. What you're seeing here is a diagram of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. And on this side, on this side we are seeing parasympathetic pathways and on this side we are seeing sympathetic pathways right. how do I know the difference well first thing is look to see where the um, the neural fibers are originating from Here's the brain stem with your first few cervical vertebrae. Here's the sacrum, C2, C3, C4, down here. We know that the parasympathetic uh, neural pathways originate in the brain stem and cervical area and the sacral area. Right? We know that the, or I did not tell you this, but the sympathetic branch of the nervous system is going to arise within the thoracic region with a couple into the L1, L2, L3 area. And so your parasympathetic, or I'm sorry, your sympathetic is originating and extending from here in the thoracic and the upper lumbar, whereas your parasympathetic is originating from the brainstem and cervical area and the sacral area. The other thing uh, that you can see here, the other thing that you can see here is that notice notice the fibers, these are the neural pathways that are extending here from the parasympathetic right? and what we see within um, the autonomic nervous system is a neural pathway that includes what we define as being a preganglion neuron with a autonomic ganglion followed by a post ganglion neuron. 
So we have a preganglion neuron that's coming off of the central nervous system. You have an autonomic ganglion, which is a bundle of neurons that's used as a processing center. And then you have another neuron that extends off of that ganglion. It's called a postganglion neuron. And it's the postganglion neuron that is innervating the target tissue. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. If you look here, here's the preganglion neuron. That is the autonomic ganglion. And then you have a post-ganglion neuron. In the parasympathetic nervous system, the pre-ganglion neuron is longer. The post-ganglion neuron is shorter. Preganglion neuron is longer. Postganglion neuron is shorter in the parasympathetic pathway. In the sympathetic pathway, the opposite is true. Here is your presympathetic ganglion. It is short. There is your autonomic ganglion, and then your post ganglion neuron is longer. Right. Sometimes there's an additional ganglion, uh, just depending on where it's going. So this ganglion here is to kind of decide, do I need to go to the liver, do I need to go to the stomach? Do I need to go to the kidney? Do I need to go to the spleen? But either way, that postganglion neuron is longer. Right? It is longer uh, inside of the sympathetic ganglion. Right? So parasympathetic, long preganglion neuron, short postganglion neuron. In the sympathetic nervous system, short preganglion neuron, long postganglion neuron. Okay, that was a lot probably for you to take in. I understand that. Um, I do want to push on because I have a little bit more that I want to talk about. Not too much more, but I do have a little bit more. And so let's go ahead and continue on. Um, if you want to pause the video here, get up, get a drink, grab a snack, uh, stretch, um, maybe restart the video and watch the first half and, and then come back through, absolutely go ahead and do that. This would be a good time to do that um, because we're going to move into looking at a little bit more detail about the pathway that I just described. And so, um, once again, this here, this is another diagram that just kind of shows again that breakdown. All right, on this side, on this side over here, we have again the parasympathetic. We know that just by looking at where these fibers are originating from. And again, over here, we have the sympathetic nervous system right? and what the impacts are here. Notice everything here is what the vagus nerve is regulating and controlling. Right? That is mentioned right there. And so how is this message sent? How do we communicate within the autonomic nervous system. Well, a lot of this I have already gone over. Um, and so this is largely a review of what we talked about right before um, that little encouraged break. All right, so um, autonomic pathways, autonomic neural pathways, right, again, have this preganglion neuron that innervates and communicates with an autonomic ganglion. And then the autonomic ganglion sends the message onto a postganglion neuron. 
and that is what innervates and communicates with the target tissue that we are dealing with. Um, this differs from the somatic pathway that we talked about within the muscular system. In other words, you had a neuron that directly communicated with skeletal muscle. All right, kind of looked like this. Right? This is what we saw. This is what we would define as the somatic neural pathway. All right, central nervous system, neuron, axon, communicating with the target tissue, such as uh, skeletal muscle, and we know that acetylcholine is what is driving this communication. <clears throat> well, in an autonomic pathway, what we have up here, it's a little more complicated than that. We have the central nervous system. You have the preganglion. neuron. All right. This here would be your autonomic ganglion, and then here would be your post ganglion neuron. And it's the job of the post ganglion neuron to go ahead and innervate with the target tissue. All right. What is the target tissue that we typically are associating with in the autonomic nervous system? All right, we're talking about smooth muscle, we're talking about cardiac muscle, and we're talking about glands, All right, salivary glands and endocrine glands. All right, down here, remember, it's all skeletal muscle within the uh, somatic pathway. This is what we would define as being the somatic, meaning body pathway for skeletal muscle. This here is the autonomic pathway. And just as acetylcholine is regulating down here, we see, depending on whether or not this is a sympathetic or a parasympathetic pathway, we see varying... Uh, neurotransmitters that are directing this. So, for example, in all autonomic pathways, the neurotransmitter that is released into the autonomic ganglion is acetylcholine. Right? That is for all autonomic pathways, both uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic. But in the postganglion neuron, in the postganglion neuron going into the effector for a parasympathetic pathway, we have acetylcholine. In a sympathetic pathway, in a sympathetic pathway, we have epinephrine. Or norepinephrine, either or. All right, so that you have a little bit of a different setup there within the neural pathways. Again, all autonomic pathways, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that is being secreted or released from the preganglion neuron into the autonomic ganglion. But when we look at the postganglion neuron into the effector, whether it's smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or a gland, if it's a parasympathetic pathway, acetylcholine is being released. If it's a sympathetic pathway, it is epinephrine that is being released. And then the adrenals have their own pathway, what we call the uh, autonomic adrenal pathway. 
uh, and that is to secrete within the uh, within the adrenal medulla, this area right here. Right, what we end up secreting from there is something called the catecholamines, and catecholamines, catecholamines are uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and they get secreted uh, directly into the bloodstream in what we define as being neuro endocrine cells, um, cells within the adrenal medulla that function as both neural cells and endocrine cells because they're secreting epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine into the bloodstream. And all hormones are secreted into the bloodstream. And so this slide here just simply uh, reviews for us where we find each of these three neurotransmitters. Right, so acetylcholine is always in the autonomic ganglion. Uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine is in the postganglion of sympathetic neurons, and acetylcholine is in the postganglion uh, neurons of the parasympathetic neurons. Um, of course, it's not as easy as that, though. If it was, I'd be out of a job. And so, um, over here, I'm going to put parasympathetic. And then here, I'm going to put sympathetic. So, acetylcholine uh, within parasympathetic and or within the autonomic ganglion have a couple different receptors that they can bind to. Right. So acetylcholine can bind to what we define as being um, muscarinic receptors or they can be bound to uh, nicotinic receptors. What's the difference? Well, if acetylcholine in the postganglion neuron is binding to a muscarinic receptor, uh, typically this is going to be cardiac muscle or smooth muscle um, or some kind of gland, um, and it will inhibit, acetylcholine will inhibit cardiac muscle when it binds to a muscarinic receptor. Or, in the terms of the intestines, it will actually stimulate a gland. And so muscarinic receptors, when they bind with acetylcholine, depending on the location, will either inhibit a response such as cardiac muscle, or it will stimulate a response such as uh, mucus glands inside of the small intestines. Inside of the autonomic ganglion, we have nicotinic receptors. And these guys are always excitatory. These guys will always stimulate a response to be sent to the post-ganglion neurons. Now, nicotinic receptors get their name because they also bind, uh, nicotine also binds to them. And so this is why smoking is addictive because it has the nicotine in it and the nicotine competes to bind to the nicotinic receptors with acetylcholine. And it becomes addictive because the body says, oh, nicotinic receptors are already full. Must not need so much acetylcholine. So we're going to back off on the acetylcholine. Those receptors are all full. Well, what happens is the nicotine wears off and your body now is not producing enough acetylcholine to bind there. And so what happens? You need more nicotine, so you smoke another cigarette. But then the body says, well, crap, we have all of these nicotinic receptors bound. We must have to add some nicotinic receptors. And so now you've got to smoke another cigarette. Now you're up to two cigarettes or three cigarettes to keep all of those receptors bound 
The problem is you're still not producing acetylcholine and your body is still producing more nicotinic receptors. And so um, the addictiveness comes into the fact that you're binding these receptors and wow, when the nicotine breaks down, there's nothing to bind to them and you're overstimulating everything. Uh, and, then, and then all of a sudden you're not stimulating anything and so you, you start to go through the withdrawal. You need to bind those receptors so that we can keep acting and performing and, and doing what it is that you're doing. So it really is um, an addictive process uh, and it's very hard to just drop that cold turkey for obvious reasons. Now, sympathetic, sympathetic, you've got what we define as being alpha um, adrenoretic or adreno, uh, adrenergic receptors and beta adrenergic receptors. Um, alpha receptors, we, we, we usually just refer to as alpha receptors, are stimulatory and beta receptors are typically inhib inhibitory. What do I mean by that? Well, if um, if epinephrine binds to an alpha receptor, it's going to promote muscular contraction. It's going to cause constriction of blood vessels, um, and it will inhibit, in this case, the intestines right? or intestinal motility. Um, whereas your beta receptors uh, are pretty much inhibitory. And what that means is if, let's say, norepinephrine binds to a beta receptors within the blood vessels, it's going to cause vasodilation. It's going to relax that muscle. But if epinephrine binds to a beta receptor in cardiac muscle, uh, it's going to actually cause more contraction. And so your cardiac output then all of a sudden increases. I know that was a lot to take in. This here is a fun little slide that kind of reviews everything that we have looked at so far. And so on this side, oops, um, on this side over here, this is our somatic pathway. And so acetylcholine is simply uh, being released from the neuron into the skeletal muscle and it will cause a contraction. Right. And then we have the three autonomic pathways. I already gave away this one. This is a parasympathetic. How do we know? Well, acetylcholine is being released from the preganglion uh, pre neuron into the ganglion neuron. And then acetylcholine is also being released into the target tissue. But notice the preganglion neuron is also longer. Postganglion neuron is shorter. Right. Which means this right here should be sympathetic pathway. Short preganglion, long postganglion neuron. Acetylcholine is still being released within the uh, autonomic ganglions, but down here you have epinephrine and norepinephrine being released into the target tissue. And then this would be the adrenal sympathetic pathway. Uh, you have your preganglion neuron that's coming into the medulla, where you have these uh, neuroendocrine cells, what we call chromaffin cells, that will go ahead and secrete epinephrine into the blood vessels, and then epinephrine will go ahead and act on the target tissue as it is. Which leads me to the last two slides that I want to touch on, and that is, uh, with all of the hype and talk about cannabis and THC and CBD and CBD oils, um, how does this all play into the nervous system? Because it, it does impact the autonomic nervous system. Um, and, and the answer to it, that is we actually have a cannabinoid system, a nervous system that acts with the autonomic nervous system. Um, it's what we call the endocannabinoid system. And the key here to remember 
is that this is a this is an offshoot of the nervous system This is an offshoot of the nervous system that works with the autonomic nervous system that's based off of two types of receptors. CB1 receptors or cannabinoid 1 receptors and cannabinoid 2 receptors. Cannabinoid 1 receptors are what you find in the central nervous system. All right. Cannabinoid 2 receptors, CB2 receptors, are what you find within the peripheral nervous system. THC. All right, tetrahydrocannabinol, all right, THC, uh, that is the active psychotropic chemical that is in um, marijuana that gives you that high. All right. Tetrahydrocannabinol is what THC stands for. THC only binds to CB1 receptors. And so THC binds to the CB1 receptors inside of the central nervous system and produces that feeling of being high. THC does not bind to CB2 receptors within the peripheral nervous system. Um, instead, cannabino uh, cannabidoil does, CBD. All right. CBD will bind to CB2 receptors, and when that happens, you don't get a high from that. Instead, what you're regulating is the immune system. You're, you're regulating inflammatory response. You're uh, regulating pain receptors, which is why we use CBD oil in pain management very often. Um, CBD oil will also increase appetite, as will THC. Interestingly enough, CBD will also bind to CB1 receptors within the central nervous system. Um, and I should mention that CB2 receptors have also been found inside of the central nervous system. So in the brain, we do have both CB1 and CB2 receptors. CBD receptors can bind to both CB1 and CB2. THC will only bind to CB1. And if CBD binds to CB1 receptors, it blocks THC. And so doing both CBD oil and true cannabis or THC, right, uh, you're actually uh, negating the impact of THC because that CBD is going to bind to those CB1 receptors and not allow THC to bind to it. And so here you can kind of see the, the impacts and the effects that, uh, that marijuana has on the varying parts of the brain. Um, this here would be specific for THC. And with that little tidbit of information, um, I am going to leave you guys alone to digest all of this wonderful information. You have completed everything that you now need to know for a and P1 and you are on your way to being ready to be successful and pass uh, your fifth and final lecture exam. Um, please continue studying and reviewing. Please continue asking questions. Uh, and with that, I'll see you guys on the flip side.